All right, so good afternoon. Welcome to the Bible study for Second Baptist Church of Ypsilanti. Today we are in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. Uh, I want to uh, remind us that our uh, Bible study will run through May. And when we get to the end of it, we will take a Bible study break and we'll be using Jackie Hill Perry's book, Upon Waking, as our devotional guide in June and July. It's a 60-day devotional, so we pray that you will go ahead and order the book now. And again, to clarify, there is no workbook that uh, goes along with that. There's some bootleg workbooks out there where people have used her work without her permission. Uh, so we certainly don't want you to buy those, uh, but we would like you to uh, get the workbook. I want to share two key thoughts from this Bible study, which are uh, one of them is controversial and we may struggle with it some, but I'll explain it later on. And the first key thought uh, from this study is number one, the power of the gospel, therefore, does not depend on the character of the preacher. Power of the gospel does not depend on the character of the preacher. That's in our lesson notes. Uh, I know that's difficult for us to deal with, but God uses people who are imperfect to preach his perfect word and to save souls. And we'll explain more about that concept. The second uh, uh, major topic in this passage is that the same God who used Moses' rod, Gideon's pitchers, and David's sling used Paul's chains. Same God who used Moses' rod, Gideon's pitchers, David's sling used Paul's chains. In other words, God is able to take our circumstances and fashion them for the advancement of the gospel. So whatever I'm going through, God can use it for his glory uh, and for our ultimate glorification and for the sanctification of ourselves and others, okay? So let's get into this a little bit. Uh, we talked about schedule already. Uh, um, um, we all also want to uh, send a shout out to Dr. Thomas Constable. We thank God for him and his work and Dr. Constable's notes, which is our background, which can be uh, uh, downloaded at PlanoBibleChapel.org slash Constable's Notes. And we pray that everybody has the notes, is in a study group and studying with some other people so that you don't have to do all the work yourself. All right. Let's get into our text then. Our text today is Philippians chapter 1. Uh, verses 12 through 20. Philippians chapter one, verses 12 through 20. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Amen. Amen. Let's get into this a little bit and talk about uh, our, our lesson. I'm not going to dive too deep, but we'll, we'll get into it. Um, one of the things that's, uh, that's, 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 that's troubling for us oftentimes is that um, our circumstances cause us to pout. Our circumstances cause us to be upset. And what Paul is arguing in this text is that the things that have happened to him, him being arrested, him being imprisoned, him being beaten, him being locked up, him being chained, literally, uh, to the imperial guards, that all of this has uh, uh, enhanced and advanced the gospel, okay? Paul sees his imprisonment as a good thing because it allows the gospel 
to advance. And God uses Paul's chains to advance the gospel. Okay. Uh, um, many of us have been through experiences that we would rather not have gone through. We'd like to press the undo button and go back. But some of the things that we'd like to erase from our history are the very things that God used to help get the gospel to other people. Okay. So there's advancement through adversity. Now, there are two groups in this passage that hear the gospel. Uh, one group is the imperial guards who are literally chained to Paul every day. Uh, Paul is under house arrest. And so the uh, guards that are chained to him, he shares the gospel with, me, with them, which means that all of Caesar's guards hear the gospel. Can you imagine if the Secret Service had us under house arrest at the White House in Washington, D.C., and every one of the Secret Service members that we were in the room with got to hear the gospel, that everybody that's on the president's staff, therefore, would hear the gospel, that everybody that comes into the White House, therefore, would hear the gospel because... <clears throat> They had a political prisoner that they were dealing with, okay? And so Paul, as a political prisoner, and let's not uh, uh, make any uh, misconception about it, Paul is a political prisoner. He's arrested. Uh, yes, he's under house arrest, but he doesn't have freedom. Yes, his friends can visit him, but he doesn't have his freedom. He uses his imprisonment as an opportunity to share Christ with other people. And in particular, two groups. One group is who? Who's the first group he shares Christ with? The guards. The guards. Who's the second group that hears the gospel because of his imprisonment? Unsaved members of the Jewish community. All right, there's unsaved members of the Jewish community, and there's possibly some Gentiles and Paul's fellow believers. Okay, so there's two groups that hear the gospel. But Paul, in spite of what he's going through, is an example for us of courage and suffering because other people see how Paul's attitude is adjusted in his prison, in his imprisonment. And the fact that he continues to spread the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ, even to his captors, causes a certain reaction among the others who are sharing in the preaching duties of the church. What's their reaction to Paul's imprisonment now? How do they respond? Some of them are inspired by the way he's um, behaving and holding up, and they're encouraged by him. Right. So they're inspired. Okay. Um, um, they're more outspoken because Paul, mm -hmm. in his chains, doesn't shut his mouth, but mm -hmm. he turns up the bond. Go ahead. Sister Argo, you were saying something? Oh, uh, well. <laughs> I was wondering why, and I just look. I was muted when I was speaking, and I was muted, and I just figured it out. Why? So, so I'm good. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, so they had they had more courage to speak the gospel without fear. Um, Doctor uh, Walvert, who I had the privilege of sitting in his classes, John Walvert, uh, back in the day, talked about the fact there are four sp scriptural reasons why Christians suffer. Um, um, and, and Paul is an example of those, but one of them is because we haven't dealt with sin. So sin causes suffering, the natural consequences of sin. Secondly, is because God wants us to gain some spiritual experience. And thirdly, is because God wants to keep us from sinning. Sometimes the Lord brings certain things in our life to keep us from messing up. And y'all, these allergies are on 10 today, which is why I'm teaching from home. So y'all just bear with me. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then the fourth is to increase our, our effective Christian testimony. We've been through some stuff mm -hmm. that God used for his glory. Okay. But there are some other people who are motivated in their preaching for the wrong reasons. What are some of the wrong reasons that people are motivated in their preaching in this passage? For self, self, <clears throat> for self, uh, um, what is it? To make themselves uh, um, be noticed or heard, uh, um, self uh, um, exalting, I'll say. Um, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, Self-exaltation. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to be noticed. Mm -hmm. And so they are preaching. What's, what was one of the other negative motivations in the passage? Envy. Mm -hmm. Rivalry. It, envy. Rivalry. Okay. Let me, let me throw a word of caution in here about envy. Be careful about wanting to be where somebody else is yes. wanting to have somebody else's assignment because yes. sometimes we don't know the suffering that goes along with the assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the assignment often looks glamorous and glorious, but there's a grimy side to uh, uh, promotion as well. And that is that to whom much is given, much is required. Amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's one more reason why, uh, some were preaching Christ. What was that? It's a positive reason. There was some who were oh. sincere about uh, their desire to save people. All right. There were some who were sincere in their desire to help save other people. Um, Paul says it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. what their motives are, okay? Um, um, let me deal with something for a second. Um, we don't have a problem with the positive side of this, okay? I want you to highlight something in your notes if you didn't already on page, uh, I think I have the page number wrong. I think it's page 34. Um, Rather than value his own comfort, reputation, and freedom above all else, he put the advancement of God's plan first. He discerned what was best. He could maintain a truly joyful attitude, even in unpleasant circumstances, because he derived his joy from seeing God glorified rather than from seeing his self exalted. Okay. He's not worried about uh, self-exaltation. He's not worried about comfort. He's not worried about his reputation. Uh, he is more concerned with the gospel. Okay. Um, and, and Paul's singular focus uh, is the reason why uh, the Lord gets the glory out of his imprisonment because his attitude is joy. Okay. His attitude is joy. Now, uh, let me back up and grab something real quick. One of the things that we struggle with is this statement, the power of the gospel, therefore, does not depend on the character of the preacher. Okay, We're wrestling with that. Uh -huh. We have a problem with that. Uh -huh. Why do we have a problem with that? Because we put the preacher at a higher standard right um, and mm -hmm. we, i guess expect i guess expect better but if it doesn't depend on the character that come out in the way that they preach that is if, if even though they're preaching the gospel it could be twisted or turned if the motives mm. aren't right and Mm -hmm. no, I, I, yeah, I'm struggling with this, but I thank you for bringing this up. I appreciate it. Okay, okay. Why, I, why, come on. I think in our society also, uh, Pastor, uh, uh, people are judged by their character uh, 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 in society. Uh, you can, 
uh, be looked, people will exclude you and you'll be looked down because of things that you do and that are judged as not the right things to be doing if you are if you were a Christian or if you're just a, a regular person that's li trying to live right for the Lord and be an example, uh, uh, society, our society highly judges people based on that. Right. right. Yeah, but I think usually uh, we oftentimes hold a preacher to a higher standard than other people, especially as it exists in our congregation. Mm. Uh, so, um, so, so let's talk about that. Why do we hold the preacher to a higher standard than we hold ourselves? Okay, I'm just, well, gonna, I'm not sure, but I think that, uh, I think that happens because uh, we, and we shouldn't, that we expect that he, or we expect that his character should be uh, how do you say it? Uh, that we expect this character to come to be more perfect than what our than what our character is. Just not sure. All right, all right. Because there was a calling on his life by God Himself, and <laughs> yes, Mr. Taylor, his character ought to be more pristine uh -huh. than the layperson. And we really hold them to a higher standard, him or her to a higher standard because of that. Um, and he leads us. He's uh, he represent us. And I don't want a shady character right. to represent me in a sense. Yeah, but right. you got shady characters in your congregation. Now, uh, I don't want to be picking on any deacons. OK, it's just as an example I can come up with. But if you have a deacon whose character is what whatever word you use, Christine or whatever, uh, you don't hold him to the same kind of accountability as you do your pastor. All right. So let's 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 talk about this for a minute. One is let's look at what Dr. Constable says in his notes. Paul believed that it was better for people with impure motives to preach Christ than that they not preach him at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the gospel getting out there is more important than the mouth that it comes out of, okay? So so God can use anybody he chooses to get the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ out to the world. And the truth of the matter is that many of the preachers that we have thrown our hats at and our handkerchiefs at had private struggles that were under wraps. OK, no person that stands in any pulpit in the world is perfect. Everybody has problems, sin issues and struggles. OK, but I will say that God can use and has used people who are affected and afflicted with sin habits to draw us to the faith that we have in Christ. Okay, here's the second thing. Um, we need to be careful because we assume that exposure to the truth automatically means conformity to it. We assume that the preacher lives at a higher standard because the preacher reads scripture more, the preacher is in prayer more, the preacher is in contact with the spirit of God in a way that sometimes we're not. But I also want to caution us because there are so many things that pastors and preachers go through in the service of the gospel that if we're not properly trained about sacrifice, about how to deal with grief, about how to deal with being attacked, uh, about having your name drugged through the mud, about having the people that you've loved and served, turn around and wound you, if the preacher has not been properly trained to expect that and how to deal with it, it can cause the preacher pastor to, to have character defects because of their own wounds that they've received in the battle. 
Okay. And so sometimes we are critical of people that, that struggle in areas and we don't understand why. Now, that being said, that being said, we all need positive models in the faith. And Paul was such. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we need to understand God's going to deal with all of our sins. The eternal consequences of our sins have been dealt with at the cross, but the natural consequences of our sins may be dealt with in this life. And sometimes God is even merciful about those. Um, um, and so the Lord uses preachers that have problems to get us saved, but he also uses people who are good examples to develop our Christian character. So Paul is saying they might be jacked up, but the gospel is going out. But in order for them to grow in their sanctification so that they look more like Christ, they need positive models. And that's the reason why his prayer is there, because he, the, he wants the church to be praying for him and for the spirit of God to help him so that he can maintain his testimony so that the church grows. Yes, sir, Reverend. Um, so I, I want to make sure I got this right. The character we're speaking of, of the preacher, is really the character he had prior to becoming a preacher. In this case. Um, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. Because there are some people who operate in their giftedness mm -hmm. and their twistedness at the same time. They're in a battle for uh, what dominates their lives. Now, the truth of the matter is that we should be fully submitted to Christ in public and in private. But God has used people who weren't to get the gospel out. Some of us got saved under the preaching of people that weren't perfect, but we grew in the faith because of positive role models in the faith. And, and I'm going to argue that the preacher ought to be that, but even if he's not, that doesn't prevent God from getting his word out. Okay. Questions, comments, thoughts. Comment. Does that, does that mean that um, we should not expect that the pastor is a should be a positive example and a role model? Um, uh, we should. We should. And, and you know, for example, for me, I say I have a I have a problem with alcohol and. Um, I'm going to the uh, liquor store, uh, party store, wherever to buy my alcohol. And my pastor has been counseling me with my drinking problem. And then when I'm going to get my alcohol, you know, my pastor is leaving out with getting his. So he's coming in behind me getting his. And that's, um, to you me, see. means Come on, sister, I'm sorry. he's struggling, I'm struggling. So how is, why is he not using the same methods to fight his addiction to alcohol that he's telling me to be using? Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. The scripture talks about in 1 Corinthians, the principle of love, that I won't do anything that causes somebody else to stumble. Mm -hmm. But let's understand that some of the things that we think are sin habits are not. Mm-hmm. So what might so a person who has an alcohol problem, who has an addiction to alcohol or an addiction to pornography or an addiction to whatever, mm -hmm. uh, that sin habit should not be enhanced or should not be promoted by making excuses for it. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we need to make sure that what we're being concerned about is an actual sin because the consumption of alcohol is not a sin for somebody who's not given over to it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The consumption of food is not a sin for somebody who's not a glutton. Mm -hmm. But if I have an issue in a particular area, I don't need to see my pastor engaging in something that I'm struggling with. That's a sin habit for me. Uh -huh. Okay. So let's say I have a problem gambling uh -huh. and I associate playing bid whist with gambling. And my pastor knows that in my past, I've blown hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting down at the, at the bid whist table. Uh -huh. Then my pastor should, should refrain from playing bid whist in front of me uh -huh. because that's a stumbling block for me. Uh -huh. Now, if he's with his family and his friends and they're someplace else and I'm not around and he's playing cards, that's not sinful. But Paul's not talking about that. What Paul is talking about, let's look at what the passage says. What Paul is talking about is people who are doing, who are preaching with the wrong motives, yet God is using their preaching to save people. And we're struggling with this one. Oh my God, Pastor, are you serious? Yes. There are people who have preached from the wrong motives, but the gospel is not tainted by the container that it comes out of because the gospel is pure. Now, the person who does that is going to have to deal with the consequences of their behavior, but not the hearer, yeah. okay? Not the hearer, okay? So, so none of us should be surprised. And I'm gonna just say this. Some of us have gone to doctors and lawyers and counselors uh, and nurses that we knew had problems. Mm -hmm but we've elevated the preacher because we think that his exposure to the sacred means that he's automatically uh, more sanctified. And unless the preacher, pastor, deacon, teacher, associate minister in their own heart has committed themselves to Christ, that might not be the case, okay? Go ahead, Rev. Um, Sister Mel has a question in the chat. <clears throat> okay. That came in right before I did. Uh, do some pastors preach for the tithes and offerings at the end? Not usually. That's kind of a false uh, thing because the church doesn't give the tithes and offerings to the pastor. The church gives the pastor usually either a salary or a love offering. Um, and, and the tithes and offering are used mostly for the upkeep of the church. Now, a portion of that does go uh, to the pastor and staff salaries. If you look at our budget, you can see that. Um, but if you're preaching for money, uh, Howard Hendricks said you're unqualified for the job <laughs> because the level of sacrifice is tremendous. Okay. So I was um, really, Pastor, I was really thinking about an example of this wrong motive and then she asked that question and i guess that is sort of an example <laughs> in a yeah. sense of wrong motive so she, she showed yeah if you question. if you but see the lord can use somebody who's preaching for money to get the gospel out in spite of that person's bad motives god can still get his word out okay uh uh so we need to be cognizant and aware of that now who do i want to sit under i want to sit under somebody who's living what they preach about Yes, yes. Be, be, because I want to see the modeling of the faith, not just the words, because sometimes our preaching is not words, it's our life. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Paul makes us balance that there are those who preach from false motives and God is still glorified because the gospel goes out. And there are those who lead from a pure heart and God is glorified because it helps the people who heard the gospel mature in their faith. Okay. Now, let me say one more thing. 
and we're gonna we're gonna move on from this. I want to encourage us to be careful about criticizing what we don't understand. Because mm -hmm. it's uh, quite a thing to deal with God's people. And here's where preacher and pew makes mistake. The preacher gets crushed because he expects the people that are getting preached to to live what they heard. <laughs> and then when the very people that you prayed with and cried with and you were there for and you got up at three o'clock in the morning and went to the hospital with and you gave somebody your money and you helped them in, in ways and you never revealed what you did for them. And for those individuals who to turn around and stab you in the back or sometimes not even in the back, in the front, it wounds people in a way that's hard to describe. Okay. And so let's give one another some grace uh, when it comes to our expectations. Yes, I want to uh, hear God's word from somebody who's trying to live right. But I also need to understand that I might not know what somebody went through that's caused them to be the way they are. Now, I'm going to throw one more thing in there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Let's jump over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Lest I be accused of uh, watering down the word. I think that the qualifications for leadership are clear. They're clear, okay? The way that we ought to behave is clear in the scriptures. But that doesn't mean that somebody did not meet all these qualifications, that that canceled the gospel, okay? So these qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter three for preachers and deacons are clear absolutely uh and for women absolutely clear as well their wives women who might be serving in these capacities as well there's some debate and we don't have to get into all of that about when it says uh wives if it's women or wives because the greek word is the same uh but there is no doubt that that's true that the the responsibility to live the gospel is clear but sometimes folk doesn't don't but it doesn't stop the gospel from getting out other questions thoughts concerns okay all right with what you said that about uh, we should not criticize things that we don't understanding but understand but uh we have a responsibility to try and gain an understanding of what it is because you can't criticize something that you, well, you shouldn't criticize something that you don't understand, uh, that you don't have the full knowledge of, uh, I'll say, to criticize it. Um, I agree with that completely. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the, the activity that we need to be more preoccupied with is restoration and helping a la Galatians 6, Matthew 18, there are times when a person has to be removed from office because they no longer meet the qualifications that are in the scripture. That is absolutely 150% true. Uh -huh. But the public criticism is where we have a problem. Because let me say something to us. When we spread this in public, it damages the reputation of the gospel and the church. So Galatians chapter six gives us an example of how to handle an erring brother or sister, okay? Uh, um, but restoration to the fellowship does not necessarily mean restoration to position. Mm -hmm. I need us to understand that. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians, Paul deals with this explicitly. He tells them to remove the evil one from among them. 
And then in 2 Corinthians, he tells them, this person has repented, allow him to return to the fellowship. But participating in the fellowship does not necessarily mean participating in leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where we have a struggle because we want to elevate people and pretend like it didn't happen, but it did. Okay. All right. Questions. Here's okay, another so, thing. Oh, come on, Sister Taylor. Okay, so Pastor Otto's, this is just for clarification. So in order to restore a person to the fellowship, that person must first repent. Is that what you're saying? Matthew chapter 18 and Galatians 6 make that very clear. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians make that very clear that there needs to be repentance on the part of the sinning brother or sister. Here's the deal. We don't we apply this to preachers, but we don't apply this to members. If the preacher can do something and he gets put out of the church, he gets put out of his position, and he's forced to leave, we ban him, we get a, a order of protection, he can't set foot in here. But the same people that he was engaging in the activity with, we never require them to repent. And the truth of the matter is that this standard applies to all of us, not just some of us, which is why we have baked into our constitution the process for dismissal and the process for restoration. Not not for preachers alone, but for members as well. Because sometimes you can get a brother or sister whose behavior is divisive and detrimental to the congregation. And then we have to deal with that through church disciplinary measures, which is Matthew chapter 18. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Struggles, questions? I know this stuff. Okay. Paul said they might be a rascal, but they're preaching the gospel. And it, and here's the other thing. We don't have to engage in the sins of other people. If I know somebody's doing wrong, I don't have to go along with what they're doing. But I also don't have to be a news reporter. Okay. One more example. We're moving on. We're going to get to these discussion questions. Today, I went to the grocery store this morning. Uh Went to the store early. Went into the store, got my water, soap, other stuff I was getting. And the lady is monitoring me mm -hmm. as I'm checking out. Mm -hmm. She's standing over me like I'm going to steal something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as I, and she even picks something up and hands it to me to make sure I ring it up. Woo. Test of my faith. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell her, don't you know who I am? I didn't say a word. I just thank you. I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. Then she comes over and scans my two cases of water. While I'm walking out the door, there's a fella coming down the aisle who has surreptitiously put two cases of Coke minis in his backpack and is walking out of the door without paying for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want it so bad to say, hey, lady, he's stealing. <laughs> and the security guard that was standing by the door didn't even see. My job in that situation was not to condemn that other man. I left that up to the Lord. Yes. But I made sure that I did what was right. Amen. Okay. And what we get upset about is we want God to punish people who appear to be prospering in spite of the fact that they're not living the way we are. Don't get into that. Because if you hang around long enough, you'll see how God deals with people. And we don't have to live for hand. Okay. So I know this is a struggle for some of us. I really do. I do understand. But Paul maintains his joy in spite of what they're doing to him personally. Okay. And that's why he says, I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers 
and hope from the spirit of Jesus Christ and whether or not Christ is honored in his body, whether by life or death. Because when we have to give an account to Christ for our stewardship, we don't want to be ashamed. Okay? So, highlight this statement as well on page 35. The believer's body is a lens that makes a little Christ look very big and a distant Christ come very close. I'm not responsible for what somebody else does. If they're doing something that's wrong, the Lord is going to deal with them. That congregation may deal with them. But my job is to make sure that I'm the best model I can be so that Christ is seen in my life uh, in spite of my flaws. Because y'all know I'm not perfect. I just thought I'd throw that out there. I got some issues. I got some struggles. I got some things that God is dealing with me on. And don't ever get in your mind that the pastor preacher is perfect. That's far from the truth. But God uses imperfect people to spread his perfect gospel. Okay. All right. Pastor, Let's get into the yes, ma'am. Good question. But does that mean that it that it's um uh wrong for me to have certain um, thoughts, certain qualities that I see that's important, that I believe are important with uh, re uh, respect, I guess, uh, for the, your pastor, the... No, your, sister, because you're in line with scripture. You're in line with scripture. First, First Timothy chapter three, as I said, makes it very clear what the qualifications are. Yes, okay. okay. So that's that's our standard. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you something. Have you ever lost your temper and said a bad word? Yes. <laughs> I have too. Mm -hmm. Somebody yeah. ever said something crazy to you and you just wanted to grab them around the neck and, str and strangle them? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So our human condition requires that we submit ourselves to Christ daily. Uh, Paul is, but Paul takes us a step further. He said, these folks are doing what they're doing because they're trying to hurt me, but God gets the glory anyhow. And we need to be mature enough to understand that that is how it is. God gets the glory even in spite of the foolish things that people do and the wrong things that they do. And that's a level of maturity that we have to get to. Okay. Cause we want God to put the smack down on somebody. Well, what if we evaluate, what if God evaluates us with the same standard we use for other people? Okay. Cause I'm, because I'm mature now and I'm living the way I am now. But what about my past? Mm -hmm. And perhaps what about my future? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so the, 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 the thing that we ought to do, brothers and sisters, is serve Christ honorably in spite of those who serve dishonorably. And we should love and pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling. And if somebody's given over to a sin, that we may need to help provide them with intervention that gets them where they need to be, if they're open to it. Because I can tell you right now, there's been some times I've gone to people uh -huh. and gotten cussed out for trying to help them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right. All right, let's get into these discussion questions a little bit. Uh, if I can remember how to do that, let's see. Here we go. All right, question number one. What did Paul want those in the Philippian church to know?
What did he want them to know? That what happened to him actually advanced the gospel and that his imprisonment is because he is in all right, all right. Yes, that it that it it advanced the gospel. Okay. Here's a question I have for us. Am I willing to allow God to use my life to advance the gospel in some unpleasant ways? Okay. Uh let's jump down to question number four. Question four. What are four scriptural reasons? What are the four scriptural reasons that Christians suffer? The four scriptural reasons that Christians suffer. Could be that they have not dealt with sin in their own lives. Um, God wants to gain, wants them to gain spiritual experience. And because God wants to prevent sins in their lives and to increase their effective Christian uh, testimony. Amen. Amen. Can you re rewind those one more time, sister? I think somebody was trying to get them. Okay. So the first one, because they have not dealt with sin in their own lives. The second, God wants them to gain spiritual experience. And the third, because God wants to prevent sin in their lives. And then the fourth one was to increase their effective Christian testimony. All right. Amen. Amen. Let's jump down to question number six. What do we learn from this passage about the character of their preacher and the effectiveness of the gospel? It's more important that the gospel gets proclaimed. Say it again, sister. It's more important um, that the gospel gets proclaimed rather than the character. Um, yes. Yes. And let me gospel. let me let me say it this way: the purity and the power of the gospel is not hindered by the character of the preacher. Okay. Um, uh, we have to remember that it is the sanctification of saints their growth in christ that may be affected however okay all right why could paul maintain a joyful attitude in spite of what he was going through does he know god lived there no mm -hmm. all right he knew god lived in him and what else? What else did he know? That the gospel was being, uh, his the goal, what he wanted was had was occurring. You know what he was uh, with all of his witnesses uh, and things that he had been doing that were being accomplished even through his um, house arrest imprisonment. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Question number nine. Read 1 John 2, 28 through chapter 3, verse 3. What might cause Paul to feel ashamed at the coming of Christ? This was this was mind-blowing right here. <laughs> what might cause him to feel ashamed in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Somebody that looked that up, talk to us about it. Yeah. All right, let's go there. Let's go there. First I, John chapter two. Oh, go ahead, sister. Oh no, I was just about to say I was I was I'm guessing, but I was just thinking about who who he was prior to the Damascus um experience that he had on the Damascus Road. Um that's the only thing that comes to my mind. Um all right, let's look at the passage real quick. So now little children remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right is has been born of him. 
See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. Look at verse two. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know this, that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Uh, so Paul's, uh, what might cause him to be ashamed was if he wasn't careful to maintain uh, his sanctification while he was working. And that's one of the reasons why I say we all have to give an account when the Lord shows up. And I don't want to be ashamed because of the things that I did while I was working for him. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the Lord, the Lord can deal with folks so much better than we can. Amen. Okay? Amen. All right. Uh, question number 10. What was Paul's greatest desire? That he continued to exalt Jesus Christ, whether he lived or died. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Let's jump down to question 11, and then we'll do 12, and then we'll be done. Question 11. What three things does Paul pray for the Philippian church? What three things does he pray for the Philippian church? Three things. You know what I recognize? That's a holdover from last week. <laughs> My fault. The answer is in verse nine from last week's lesson, that their love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment so that they may approve the things that are superior, may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. Okay. All right. Well, Saints, listen, let me thank you for spending some time hanging out with us in Bible study today. Uh, uh, I know that some of these things are hard for us to wrap our minds around, but the reality is that Christ is coming soon and we need to get the gospel out to every person, to every person, um, and that God can use us in spite of our flaws. Now, that doesn't mean that we make excuses for them. It doesn't mean that we are uh, uh, given over to sin, but if we should sin, scripture tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, that God is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then chapter 2 tells us that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So let's be praying for one another. I'm going to stop the recording at this time, but don't hang up. Thank you so kindly, Reverend Jones. If you could do that for us, we'd appreciate it.